John Zimmerman, you're in good traffic. First of all, thank you so much for being here today. I've wanted to have this conversation for quite a while. Uh, been a fan of yours for a long time and, and all the great work that you put out over there at Active Town. So first of all, thank you for, for coming on the show today and for taking some time. Oh, my pleasure. A pleasure to be here. So I've been always been intrigued, and I know, I know a little of your backstory just from following along with your work, but this is obviously an intro. We have strong towns. We have all these different kinds of towns conversations, right, that have taken off. And I think for Americans in the American context, which is what we talk about mostly on this show, um, that's a very palatable idea, right? We sometimes have this fear of the big city and places like New York, and there's this reputation or almost an asterisk that comes with them that most folks just turn off in terms of implementing into their own life because they feel like it's unrelatable. I'm really curious for you, just that overall framing of active towns, what was kind of the lead up to that? And how did you decide on this as the main and overall framing for all the work that you've done as of late? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, really, I try to emphasize for folks that the, the term don't read too much into the terminology of towns. It's really just a proxy for habitation, community, city, town, village, whatever. Uh, it's it's pretty, I think, agnostic. Um just like with Chuck is with strong towns. I mean, yeah, he's talking cities as well. So don't read too much into it. Um, although both Chuck and I uh, both hail from small towns, him up in Brainerd, Minnesota, and me in Lincoln, California. Uh, Lincoln was much smaller at maybe when I was growing up there, maybe 4,000 people. Uh, but yeah, it's it really the concept and in, in how I came to the naming of my initiative, Active Towns, was really a simple matter of that was the URL that was available at the time. <laughs> so activetowns.com and activetowns.org was was available. Uh, active cities was not. Active communities was not. Hence, active towns. Uh, and really, my background uh, as an exercise physiologist, as a health promotion professional with uh, 34 years in healthcare, uh, well, it used to be healthcare cost containment, and, and then it sort of changed over to more public health and really trying to encourage people to live healthy, active lifestyles, uh, you know, really focusing in on our cities and our communities and our towns and our built environment and how that either encourages or discourages uh, active living. And so that's how I came uh, to, you know, the concept came to the name. That's the short version of it. There's a longer version too. <laughs> sure. No, I love that. I love sometimes that we just yeah. settle for things where we have to kind of work with what we got in terms yeah. of a URL or something like that. So that's amazing. I love yeah. getting into that health conversation the way that you have, right? There's obviously a million ways to approach that conversation. Do we talk nutrition? Do we talk as you are built environment is obviously I'm a believer in as well. What was kind of the moment that the fork in the road that led you to double down on this community side of things as a conduit or, or really a catalyst for how to actually make and implement change, whether it be here in the U.S. or, or otherwise. Why did you decide that route versus, say, a nutrition or another piece like that is kind of the main focal point of your work? Well, actually, it, it, the first half of my career really was more holistically looking at uh, health promotion uh, from a nutrition and uh, exercise and uh, stress management perspective. Uh, for the first 15 years of my career, I was working with Fortune 500 companies actually doing healthcare cost containment strategies on their large corporate campuses, uh, including at IBM, Motorola, and, and many other big name uh, companies that I had worked with uh, during that, that first half of my career. And uh, the, really that, that the impetus that you know, kind of caused a little bit of a shift in my mind and my thinking was uh, when I moved from Boulder, Colorado to Honolulu, Hawaii. And that change, uh, it, it was a, a change that was sort of like a, a, a shift in, in life. Uh, it was a quality of life thing. Um, I loved Boulder, really you know, enjoyed living there for a decade, uh, but I needed a change of pace and I needed to change the scenery. And so uh, I accepted a position uh, that took me into more of the hardcore medical world. I was uh, working with physicians, uh, mostly orthopedic surgeons and pain management doctors and, and, and such. And, uh, but I was also at the time an Ironman distance triathlete. And so I was out training every single day on my bike or running or in the pool swimming or in the open water swimming. And so that move from Boulder to Honolulu, I was like, 
cool. I'm going to be an endless summer. I can train to my heart's content uh, that year, uh, which would have been, I think it must have been the latter half of 2004. Uh, I was that next year, uh, that the, the next summer, I was uh, basically enrolled or what it registered. That's the word I'm looking for. Registered in the Ironman Canada competition up in uh, British Columbia. And, uh, so I was like, okay, perfect. I can get there. I can get training and I can, you know, really, uh, be ready for this event. Uh, now mind you, I wasn't a professional triathlete. I was just an age grouper. I was only in it for fun. Uh, and so it wasn't like my life, my livelihood was depending on this. And so it was even more shocking to me that when I landed on the ground in Honolulu, I found that the streets were so incredibly hostile. Um, it's just not a very fun place to be a runner or a person on a bike. And so I had a hard time training. And quite frankly, it just bummed me out. And uh, I became a part of a really wonderful training group uh, there in, in the Honolulu area. And that made it a little better. But, uh, you know, we had, there was a couple of, of car crashes and incidents where uh, members of our team were hit or nearly hit or, you know, crashes, et cetera. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. What am I doing? Uh, again, because it's not my livelihood. It was just a passion. And so I, I basically withdrew for the ra- from the race, sold my bike, bought a surfboard or two <laughs> and, uh, turned my attention to the ocean. And in fact, I, I picked up Hawaiian outrigger canoe paddling. I joined the Huli Nalo, uh, paddling club and, uh, just had a great time integrating myself in the Ohana, the family, the Hawaiian family, uh, that is, uh, outrigger canoe paddling. And, uh, and yeah, so that was the first impetus for me to like really kind of shift my thinking a little bit is that, the built environment has a truly profound impact on our ability to lead the type of lifestyle we're looking to lead. And so uh, that was really the turning point for me. I stayed in that job for about a year and then had an opportunity to move to the big island of Hawaii. And when I got there, I, I sort of got myself um, integrated in with the advocacy organization, the bicycle advocacy organization over there. Uh, it's called PATH, the People's Advocacy for Trails Hawaii. And that was their previous name. And um, and I was like, yeah, we need to be doing a better job of creating a, a safer, more inviting environment so that people can walk, bike, run, and, and do things out in, in our streets and in our environment. And that led me down the, the rabbit hole of urbanism and uh, active mobility advocacy work. And yeah, I've never looked back since then. So uh, I've been at this for, you know, coming almost 20 years or so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's coming up on that. And it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to really, uh, really establish myself as one of the go-to individuals here globally that really sees things through that lens, the built environment through the lens of, uh, what I like to call activity assets. Will this encourage people to live a healthy, active lifestyle or not? And you've got both hardware activity assets and software activity assets, which we can talk about later. Uh, but yeah, that was the, the key point. It was, it was literally a physical move of me moving from Boulder to, to Hawaii and then me getting my teeth kicked in and, and basically was like, yeah, I don't want to be out here. I, you know, it's not even fun to run on these streets, let alone ride a bike on these streets. And so that was the, the real shift in momentum for me and how I uh, found myself really focusing in on the built environment. I love that story. I think anecdotally, you know, I have a lot of friends who are not in this urbanism realm, but who are athletes, even just in a casual sense, like you mentioned, not folks that are even training for a race, but just folks who are doing it to take care of themselves. It's always interesting when and if they cross that threshold into understanding the things that they face on a daily or weekly basis as, you know, problems for a runner versus problems with the infrastructure or the built environment. Uh, right. That's a really interesting path that you were able to bridge in your mind. Or did that come through uh, talking to people? Like, I, I can imagine, at least from personal experience, when you start to have some of these thoughts about this larger world around you, and you go, oh, this is interesting how intersections work this way or how lanes and, and right of way work this way. Um, you start to kind of have all these thoughts that you don't have framing for, you don't have language for, you don't really know where to go with it, who's responsible, how that decision got made. Was there an outlet for you locally there in terms of did you end up 
um, bouncing ideas off of some folks first, just to be like, do I have this right? Or am I crazy? Is this sound conspiracy theory esque? <laughs> or was it more just you, you know, dove into the books and started to do research on your own? I'm always fascinated if folks, you know, gravitate towards community first on this front, or if they go more rabbit hole route in terms of learning more about the larger context. You know, it's a good question. It was a little of both for sure. For sure. I mean, we're, we're talking circa 2006, you know, 2007 ish of really diving deeply into this uh, information. And so, um, you know, I started, yes, reading some of the uh, seminal works that were out there, including uh, James Howard Kunstler and uh, Andreas Duwani and Liz Platter Zeigberg and, and uh, Jeff Speck's book. Uh, and really understanding the urbanism side of things. Um, also reached out and befriended uh, Dr. Dick Jackson, who at the time was at uh, the universe, or University of California at uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, and, um, and had the opportunity to speak to his graduate class a couple of times there in, and in Los Angeles. And, and really, it was both. It was that community aspect of like talking through these things and like bouncing ideas off. It was diving deep into the literature and understanding that. Um, a, a couple of years later, when Chuck Marone started to get his Strong Towns blog going, I uh, started, you know, catching that and started reading the blog, listening to his podcast. And so it just sort of all sort of added on to each other. And so there wasn't any like, other than the moment that I just talked about of the epiphany of, oh, there's something wrong here. The rest of it was just sort of uh, piling on of information and giving context to the nuance that is all of these things that we see out there. And for me, there was a little bit of turning off my athlete mind and looking at looking at it more from a public health and encouragement standpoint of just not even even just looking at active mobility from a health perspective and a health enhancement and health promotion perspective, but even just from a utilitarian perspective of can I even get to, you know, the corner store if a corner store even exists. And so, you know, really starting to understand, you know, the impacts of how we built our environments and how we built our streets and, um, and really bringing all of that together. Eventually, what ended up happening was I started developing sort of what I would refer to as like the active towns, you know, tenants and the active town sort of manifesto, if you will. And it really starts to look at blending in, you know, what I had mentioned earlier, the, the activity assets that are the hardware and the software. The hardware is the built environment. It's those places that you can put a pin in a, mo uh, in a map and say, hey, over here, we've got a protected bike lane. Over here, we've got a, a wonderful pathway that people can use. And oh, by the way, there's parks over there and there's a wonderful public pool over here. And the next thing you know, you're starting to say, oh, okay, I get it now. These are like the places that you know people can really go to that really help increase the likelihood that they can live a healthy, active lifestyle. The software is really everything from the policy that helps bring the hardware into existence to the programs and activation and encouragement and education and awareness, all of these things that need to take place to activate the hardware keep it well maintained and keep it moving and firing on all cylinders. The whole mantra of build it and they will come doesn't really work when you have a culture that isn't established. There isn't a culture of activity. There's going to be a certain amount of pent up demand. And so you'll have a latent demand that'll just automatically use it if you build it, but not necessarily as many people as one would like to see. Therefore, you have to have both the hardware and the software working well in concert together. And so I, I, te I think about the world that way. I see the world through that lens of activity assets. And then I really hone in on what it means to create an environment that's appropriate for all ages and abilities. And that's really me having that epiphany of, okay, yeah, take your, your athlete, take yourself out of this and really focus in on, you know, your, your previous clients from your, your previous 15 years of, of trying to get sedentary people active. How do you do that? You have to support them. The way that you support them is first, you got to build the infrastructure. And then second, you've got to be able to have the programming to be able to help them do that change in behavior, because we're talking about behavior change here when you're talking about trying to establish a culture of activity. 
Certainly. And I think the active transportation piece, this is the thing I think about more than anything on in, in my own mind is I love public transit a lot. In a perfect world, if I got to make all the rules, I would like active transportation to still be the primary and salient form of getting around, even above, you know, great trains and all that stuff. I just think because of the stuff, exact things that you're talking about and that you, you know, talk about all the time, there is this multiplicative kind of deck of benefits that no other form of movement provides us, which is like, if you commit to this lifestyle, you will see a cognitive benefit. You will see a physical benefit. You'll see an economic benefit. There's not that many things that fit that many solution bases in terms of, you know, what it touches and how it covers. Um, but it also, to your point, requires the biggest push of personal and interpersonal change and and communication from the person trying to provoke that change, I think, is, is really fascinating. I would love to hear, and you mentioned a minute ago, some of those uh, methods that you've gone back to from your previous work with your clients as you approach those conversations. Because, I mean, I, I lived out in Arizona for a long time and I would bike all summer long, but like that's a prime example of we could build amazing bike lanes and infrastructure. I lived at cul-de-sac out there. We had a lot of fantastic infrastructure that was, you know, at least on the block level, but also, you know, starting to blossom in and around in the larger Tempe and Phoenix context. But at the end of the day, when June 25th or June 15th comes around and that temperature is up above 110, even your committed cyclists might second guess going to a meeting at, at 2 p.m. that is across town on a bike. So the question is like, how do you convince folks that the little bit of sweat that's going to be involved in that is worth it? How do you provide a solution set that lets them circumnavigate that? I spent a lot of time trying to perfect my communication in that conversation. And I think a lot of folks listen to this show. Um, I talk to a lot of folks that live in cold places and, 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 you know, East coast or just North, you know, Minneapolis, twin cities sort of place, or even Pacific Northwest, you have a lot of momentum behind what they're talking about, but there's still that really big challenge in communicating to the folks that live in and around them that, Hey, this is something you can do as an actual form of transit to the point where you could get rid of your car or downsize your family's car load to one less than it is right now. I would love to kind of hear some of those skills that you've implemented from that work you were doing with clients to folks in this realm as you're talking to them. I think the most important thing is to approach this with a sense of empathy, that it is a challenge, you know, kind of changing status quo. It's a challenge to change the way that we have established a routine. So habit formation is, is a critical part to this. So having that empathy to understand that change is difficult and, and then starting from there, from that point. The other thing I always like to emphasize too is that from you know from the human standpoint, from a human physiology standpoint, we you know are pretty much unless we have a, unless we an individual happens to have a specific um, disability or a condition that doesn't allow them to to live a, an active lifestyle, for the most part, humans are at a really really weird point in time in our human history. We're at a point in time where we have uh, both access to unlimited calories, nearly unlimited calories, okay, as long as your budget will will take you, um, but it, it, and and also the ability to to get those calories without a whole lot of exertion. For much of our entire existence, we would spend the entire day trying to get the food that would keep us alive, and then. The rest was, you know, a little bit of dancing and grooving and communicating and development of language and, of course, uh, procreating. Yeah, got to got to grow the species. We're at a really weird period of time where, especially in the last 120 years since the advent of the automobile, we've been become even more sedentary, and so it's a it's an interesting balance that we have here. So. We've got a situation where we have the capacity to do amazing physical events and endurance things like an Ironman, you know, 140 plus mile day. But for the most part, what we do as individuals is we have a hardwired default to be a little bit lazy. You know, you probably have seen the, the, the funny photograph of, you know, 
two people on an escalator going up to the 24 hour fitness and right next to the, the, the left of the escalator were the stairs, you know, the irony of course is, is that they're going to go into the, the, the 24 hour fitness after going up the escalator to then, you know, get on the stair climber or a treadmill or whatever and exert themselves. And so it's just one of those things that we have to have an appreciation for is that we are hardwired to take the, the easier way. Yeah. doesn't mean that we can't, you know, remind ourselves and we, it doesn't mean that we can't create an environment that supports the more active way, but then we start getting into the, the context and the nuance of what it means to be able to build an environment that's truly safe and inviting and welcoming so that that active choice is the more natural choice or Maybe that's not the right framing, maybe not the more natural uh, choice, but a natural choice, just like reaching for the car keys has become a pragmatic choice. And I think pragmatism and the ease of operation of motor vehicles has been our biggest you know, challenge because it is so easy just to grab the car keys and go unless you happen to live in a particular community where to do so is a either a financial hit or is some form of friction like in really bad gridlock traffic there's not a lot of incentives to to do it otherwise if the built environment doesn't provide you mobility choice mobility choice is the absolute I think if you're looking for like the crystal ball or whatever, you're looking for the magic pill. The, the magic pill is mobility choice. It's overlapping of networks and transportation and mobility systems that give people the ability to make a pragmatic choice and be able to say, you know, hey, I'm going to do this tr particular trip. I need to, you know, go over here and I can jump in the car. Yeah, I can do that. Maybe there's some friction here and there. Maybe it, it, I have to pay something when I park, when I get there. But I can also choose to take transit. I can also choose to take an active mobility choice. And more than likely, I have the ability to combine mobility choices. For instance, I can walk to the train station, take the train to the next village over, or, the, or, or a streetcar line or a tram line, and then get off and walk to the final destination. Or in the case of the Dutch, doing a wonderful job of combining the bike and the train network to such that it's just, it's phenomenal how well those two systems work together where, you know, somebody will start their journey by getting on their bike and then going to the train station, parking their, their bike in a very nice, convenient, secure bike parking garage, and then, you know, take their train to their, their destination, whether it's going like from Utrecht to Amsterdam and, and then, you know, maybe they decide that, oh, you know, I can, when I get off the train, I can either take the tram or I can walk, or if it's too far to walk and the tram's not the right choice, maybe I can just check out an Ove Feats. And so there's an integrated, you know, public bike option that is tied to your transit card so that you can check out a bike and go and make that, you know, final mile, final two miles, final three miles, you know, very, very feasible for you. And so being able to com combine those things is there. But I think going back to, you know, some of the magic things that I, that I realized, you know, in, in how of, of my previous job, previous career, and then really looking at this is having that sense of empathy for where people are at and being appreciative of the fact that this stuff is hard and the way that we can make it easier and we, I'm using the imperial we of, you know, city leaders and advocates and everything is doing whatever we can to meet people where they are on this journey that they're on and, and creating a situation so that there's, you know, more onboarding points for people, a simple painted bike lane or a, a protected quasi protected, <laughs> you know, enhanced separation bike lane on a busy street might be fine for somebody who is confident and fearless, but for an all ages and abilities, you know, facility, you're looking for more authentic protection or separation 
uh, getting away from, you know, being pummeled by the noise and the exhaust and the threat of, of motor vehicles. And so understanding where people are coming from, I think is, is, is a very, you know, wise way to go about it. If you're looking for the number of people, the, the grandest number of people to participate in this. As a health per- promotion, promotion professional, it's easy for me to say, I also have come to the realization that talking about health in disease prevention and, and, and this kind of stuff doesn't really resonate with most people for their decisions, their daily decisions, as much as making sure that that mode, uh, that opportunity to go for a walk instead of a car drive or a bike ride instead of a car drive is, is more about that pragmatism. It's more about the delivery today, more so than the delivery decades down the line of cancer prevention or heart attack prevention or stroke prevention. And so it, it's the, the health side of it is a long game. The more immediate side of it is what can, what can this mode, what can this way of life provide for me today? And then that's where you start to get into, well, this is a more pleasurable experience. This is a higher quality of life. This makes me feel better today. And so there, now you're starting to get into the mental health side of things and well-being side of things. And that can deliver dividends you know, today when you can do it, especially when cities take the care to build out an all ages and abilities network that is truly beautiful and engaging and really delightful for people to, to, you know, to go about their, their business on. And, and what's really nice about building out a safe and inviting all ages and abilities network is that people can use that across all of their different reasons for engaging with that, that, facility. It could be that utilitarian trip. It could be a kid trying to get to school or to, you know, a ball practice after school or visit a friend, or it could be an elderly person wanting to, you know, engage with, you know, friends of theirs, or it can be, you know, the dude who's getting a workout in as well as folks just going about their daily, you know, business, you know, trying to go, uh, you know, get some utilitarian trips in. And that's the beauty of, creating a network that really kind of encompasses, you know, all of these, all ages and abilities, this mantra, it gives that facility the ability to serve multiple purposes. It doesn't have to be just recreation. It doesn't have to be just utilitarian. It can serve both. You just need the connectivity to make sure that that can happen. Certainly. Yeah. The systems level view of things. I, I go to Portland, Oregon a lot. I spent a lot of time up there. I was there the whole month of July this year. And that was my main takeaway. I talked about many times on this show, but the main takeaway from my time there is always like the, the antithesis of what most cities do, which is, Hey, we built this. So now we're not going to build this other thing. Cause we already have that. Oh, we already have a bus there. So now why would we build another transit method? Because we already did the bus and no one's riding that. Versus how Portland and, and the few cities in the U.S. that really do get this systems level look at things is, well, because we have a bus there, we should build the streetcar because then we'll be able to connect this other neighborhood to this bus network that's already strong um, or vice versa the other way, right? This this bus connects folks to the streetcar, which then takes them to this location or that location. It's just this foundational difference that, I mean, you mentioned the Netherlands, right? It's the obvious example that we all look to and, and think is amazing. It's It's like... This idea that instead of looking at things as, well, because we did that, we're not going to do this. It's, well, because we did that, we are going to do this so that that and this become stronger together. I love that. And I also love on that personal level, like you mentioned, right? The example of the gym, the escalator, right? That's the uh, most amazing one ever because it kind of really fully encompasses this whole conversation, which is to say, um, we need to, and this is how I've really started to approach this myself with conversations with folks as we're, as we're talking about here, to, to explain how the economical choice is one of active mobility, or I kind of like to refer to it as like baking mobility into your lifestyle, which is, hey, you and there's a group of people in, in the US, even if it's not a majority, a sizable enough, strong enough group that say agrees on something, a truth, like going to the gym is value. 
I think a lot of people agree on that. Or taking a run is valuable. These things that we have enough people on board with already that we don't have to convince people that there is value in those things. Okay, so we take that truth. And then to your point, we say, well, you're already allocating time every day to doing that thing. Got it? And people usually are like, yes. And it's, well, what if you could get the same benefit of that thing, baking it into other stuff that you're already spending time doing, which actually might give you some time back? And this is kind of my approach always to getting folks to try and make an attempt at walking to the office or biking to the office or to the gym or wherever it may be, or to the grocery store. Um, it's like, you're doing this. You're setting aside an hour to do this. This might add 15 minutes to your four trips a day, but you're going to come out about even and you're going to get all these mental, you know, endorphin based benefits of being outside and being amongst nature and amidst nature. Um, so I think your point there is like really strong, which is that the strongest way to do this when we don't yet have that systems level as some cities do is to convince people that economically speaking, whether that's time, economies of, of time or, or money, um, this is going to give you that immediate return because we've seen whether it's an environmental conversation or an economic conversation or a health conversation, these real long term talking points, especially to a younger generation who's setting their habits for forever and for their future, don't seem to move the needle to the extent that we would wish they do. So I do really love that framing and that approach of, of you know, really breaking it down to like, you're going to see a benefit in terms of time or money next week if you start doing this. And I think that gives a lot of people the courage to at least go out and, and brave a, a subpar bike lane or, you know, try that sidewalk that goes on that busy road that they haven't ever been super excited about trying out before in the meantime, until we get the systems level look. So I love that framing. Let, let me let me kind of uh, respond to one thing that you're saying yeah. there and, and issue a caution. It, when we start using framing um, from an economic um, model perspective, one of the things that we have to be conscious of is the fact that there's a lot of sunk costs in auto dependency. And so, you know, a, part of, of the challenge in a system where you're already paying a certain amount that is your sunk cost on an annualized basis and maybe a monthly car payment and insurance and all these other things, the, the sort of the variable, the, the incremental cost that happens on a monthly basis that could go up and down is really mostly just fuel costs and other maintenance costs with motor vehicle. And so it's, there's also that kind of inherent incentive within a person's mind to reach for the car keys because eh, I've, it's my sunk cost. I'm already paying for it. And so that puts even more pressure, I think, on us. And again, the imperial us, just like the imperial we, of communities to create environments that, that really provide and deliver on a pleasurable experience. And one of the great examples I love to use is, is, is leaning into the fact that if you have a, a, a very well built out cycle network and you can pretty much, you know, be assured, rest assured that you can get to all destinations on a bike, some of those routes are going to be less pleasurable than others. And so when we're looking at the behavior change and establishing a habit, the more pleasurable that experience can be, the more bang for the buck, you know, that sort of what you're saying, you know, I'm getting something back from participating in this. I get my return, the better, because if it's, if it can be super, super pleasurable, then you get that dopamine hit afterwards of, yeah, you know, that was really great. And the fact that I took that quieter route through that leafy tree canopied residential street, or instead of taking the busy route, cause I didn't need to take the busy route this, you know, on this particular trip, I veered off and took the park route and oh my gosh, I didn't realize the wildflowers were in bloom. It, it was so wonderful. And I saw a bunch of kids playing and et cetera. I'm basically describing to you my bike ride with Jason Slaughter from not just bikes in Amsterdam. In, in 2022, he took me for a bike ride in Amsterdam and he wanted to show me kind of the fact that, yeah, we can ride on a protected bike lane on busy strodes, you know, sort of the Dutch version of these busy strodes. And they were very busy. 
But then he was like, watch this. And so we veer off and then go through a whole network of parks parallel to a lot of busy streets that had protected bike lanes. And it was just so much more pleasurable. So when we're getting to having that conversation, like you're talking about of that bang for the buck of, you know, of your time or your energy and being able to deliver, it needs to be, you know, that combination of convenience you know, from a pragmatic standpoint, but then also comfort. And when we can actually deliver on providing, again, safe and inviting and welcoming places that also kind of put a little joy in there too, that helps reestablish, uh, again, that behavior change that we're trying to get. We're trying to get routines to become established and, and, and we can go a long way to getting there. It, nothing against, you know, the protected bike lane that has to exist along a road to be able to get to meaningful destinations. If your your city doesn't have the political will to get rid of the road or downsize it to the point where it's completely traffic calmed, that has to be built too. But making sure that we have established and promoted the alternate higher comfort routes so that we can get that that sort of bang that you're talking about in terms of return on investment, uh, you know, for, for folks to take the active mobility option. Yeah, for sure. I, I love all of that. Is there, I'm curious, one thing I wanted to ask you, you know, you see in like magazines and just news sites in general, they always do these rankings of healthiest places to live. Right. And it's, I always sometimes chuckle at the list. Cause I'm like, how, how did they determine this? What was, what went into, you know, settling on this list? And it's not just the healthiest, all these lists kind of make me laugh in general. Sometimes I feel as though they mislead people more than they help them. Uh, we can get into that conversation if we want, but I'm more just interested. What do you think that, you know, maybe someone who is just looking at it from a more, you know, bird's eye view, not getting in the weeds on the health and activity elements or as you are, um, what do you think they might miss when they're looking at, how to grade or analyze or evaluate a place for its level of readiness to be called an active community, to embrace that as a community, not just, you know, individuals ad hoc going off and, and braving their own path, but where an entire place can truly adopt and kind of fit into the vision that you have, I think, and I have for communities and how they move. I'm curious because I'm, I'm imagining there are some things that get glossed over that are a bigger deal than we might think on the surface. Yeah, you, you don't have to dig very deep into the data collection that takes place when we see the lists of the healthiest communities or the most active communities, et cetera. It's almost always some sort of indirect proxy that they're measuring, um, or it's through evaluating uh, maybe survey data or the census data. And it's just like, yeah, none of that. We're, we're terrible at collecting good data. And I, I really hesitate. Like, for instance, you know, folks have been clamoring. I, I, I launched Active Towns in, uh, in 2013. So it's been over a decade that I've been working, you know, on this particular part of the initiative. And I spun this initiative off from my nonprofit, Advocates for Healthy Communities, which is a 501c3 that I established back in, in 2011. It is uh, incorporated in Boulder, even though at the time I was still living in Hawaii. But that's another story um, completely. But yeah, it's it's really, really difficult to really you know be able to get good data so that you can do a true ranking of things. Plus, I really hesitate from doing rankings. I really hesitate. You know, people will tell me, will ask me all the time, so what's the best active town? You know, da, 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 da. And I say, look, I, I put them all into like four buckets. I, I put them into the, uh, the buckets of... Uh, an established active town at the at the most active side of things. And when I say most active, I'm like, look, I'm not going to measure it. You're not going to measure it. Nobody has the real capacity of measuring it scientifically. But you kind of know. If it's an active town, you kind of know. And that's the Boulder, Colorados of the world. You know, that's the Bend, Oregon's. It's like culture... A, a culture of activity permeates through the DNA of the place. Okay. It's, it's well established. People will actually go out of their way to move there. Um, and in fact, that's the origin of the name. I mentioned to you earlier that I ended up landing on the active towns name because it's active towns.org and active towns.com was available. 
the reason why I was even looking was because I had just completed a, a, a survey over the previous year in, in 2012 of um, thousands of people who were participating in Ironman distance triathletes. And I was actually asking them the question, where do you live and why did you move there? Because I knew that they were a very, very interesting group. They had a very high socioeconomic status level. The per capita income of Ironman distance triathletes is well over a hundred thousand. And I mean, they're you know a lot of these guys are riding twelve thousand dollar bikes. You know, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I want to understand why you chose to move. You know, where you did, and in what was that deciding factor. So where you live and why you moved there. And through the focus interviews and some of the surveys that they completed, I kept hearing this over and over again, over again. Oh, we moved here because there was just this culture of activity. We moved here because this is an active town. We moved here because it's a healthy, active community. I'm like, okay, I got to study this a little bit more. That's when I launched the initiative. That's when I did the search to see if uh, active communities and active cities was available. It wasn't. Active towns was. So established active towns is, is at that, that far end where we're at. The next, you know, down from that is what I call emerging active towns. These are places that are starting to do the things that are, you know, need to be done because, you know, they, they get it. They're like, you know what? We need safer places for people to walk. We need people to be able to get to trails and pathways and pools without having to drive everywhere. And in fact, guess what? We have a dearth of, you know, uh, we need more pools and more parks in certain neighborhoods because we've forgotten about them completely. So, you know, that's one of the things that we see is the emerging active towns, those that are actually going beyond just planning and actually starting to build out their networks and putting in, you know, those facilities. The aspiring active towns is the next down on the list. These are the ones that are like, okay, we know we have a problem. And we know we need to do something. Let's get this planning process moving. Let's start, you know, doing some tactical urbanism. Let's do something so that we can get to that next level of, of, you know, what I'm talking about in terms of emerging. They're starting to get some momentum going. The, the, at the bottom end of all of this is what I call latent active towns, latent communities that don't even understand that they've got a problem. You know, they're just sort of blissfully ignorant in, you know, going about thinking that they've got a high quality of life uh, until they realize one day that, you know, they have been bestowed, you know, the fattest, most obese, least active, you know, thing based on, you know, the CDC doing some, you know, more scientific analysis. I'm saying, oh, yeah, this is like one of the least healthy places ever. Uh, Oklahoma City. That was really what prompted them to have a, a, a major sea change in things as they realized that they were in the top five least healthy, highest obesity rate cities in the nation. And the mayor was just like, no, this is not going to stand. We need to do something. And Mick McCormick, the mayor at the time was just like, you know what? We're going to turn this around. We're going to we're going to become a more walkable, bikeable place. We're going to get ourselves moving a little bit, fully knowing that the really the way the triggers that we have to be able to do some of this is yes, you need access to parks, you need access to pools, you need access to other places where people can live a healthy, active lifestyle. But you have to change the built environment too. You have to become less car dependent. You have to create more opportunities for people to walk and bike. Uh, they hired Jeff Speck uh, from Walkable City, and then that's became part of the transformation and the success story that is Oklahoma City, which was one of the reasons why they hosted the Congress for New Urbanism just a couple of years ago. I love that example. I was actually going to ask you, uh, that emerging category to me is really exciting because there's some momentum. They're not the places that already have a pre-baked reputation necessarily as like the place that's gone too far this way or it's just known for this pigeonholed it really has an open ability to to do you know a various amount of things in terms of how it positions itself in that even active towns landscape and offering to you know americans or others who are looking to move somewhere different or just move to a different neighborhood within one of those cities i i would be curious and 
maybe other than Oklahoma City. Is there a, a city that fits into that emerging kind of categorization that's not one of the ones that we hear about all the time that you think is is something to be bullish on, a place to really be excited and optimistic about over the next, say, five years here? Yeah, I mean, certainly, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I want to also emphasize, too, that even like with the established active towns, these established places that clearly have a discernible culture of activity happening, they're not perfect. You know, they still have huge challenges ahead uh, of them. And that kind of also sort of channels the spirit of the Dutch too, of their constantly tweaking the, the, their systems to make it even more appealing and, and get more people engaged. And because of induced demand with, you know, building out cycling infrastructure, it's no different than induced demand of adding lanes to a freeway. Uh, you attract more people into it. And so you find yourself going, oh, okay, now we have crowds on our cycle network. We need to reshape things. We need to re reevaluate how we're doing. So having that continuous spirit of knowing that continuous improvement has to happen. So even the established active towns, it's not a, uh, it's not a, something that's fully baked and is done. You're constantly working on that. So going back to your question though on emerging is one of the biggest challenges that, that cities have when they start to actually put stuff on the ground they start doing things. They start saying, okay, we know that we need to do this. We've, you know, pulled together our comprehensive plans for the city, for our mobility network, for our parks network. We need to start building this stuff out. As soon as that starts happening, the haters show up. Why? Because you're changing the status quo. And whenever you're changing the status quo, you get your challenges. And then that's the, the person who's just, or the group of people who are just like, no, we don't want that pathway or that trail going behind our property. You know, we, we fear the unknown. We fear that there's going to be the wrong type of people will then come and rob my place and steal this and da, 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 da. No, I don't want to see a reduction in on-street parking or shifting uh, a travel lane over and shifting the parking so that you would create a parking protected bikeway. Why are we doing this? There's nobody riding bikes now. Why are we doing this? It's when the status quo haters start to come out. Um, and again, we have to have some empathy for these people because they don't know any other way. This is what we have given them. This is what we have built for these people, these people, all of us, <laughs> this is what has been built for us over the past 80 or so years. Yeah. You can name just a whole plethora of places that are emerging and are really doing wonderful stuff. Um, right here in Austin, Texas, where I live. I kept hearing over and over and over again, dude, you got to get down to Austin. You got to check this out. I did. I, I, basically a decade ago, uh, May of 2014, I was actually delivering a keynote presentation along with Chuck Moran from Strong Towns down at the Health and Built Environment Conference down in San Antonio, uh, which was put together by the University of Texas in San Antonio down there. And so we were, we were he, he was the, he was the keynote and I was the, the backup, uh, you know, number two, uh, in the delivering our presentations, him giving his curbside chat, me giving my active towns, creating a culture of activity, uh, presentation. And, uh, on the way back up, because he had a curbside chat in San Marcos, uh, I met up with a friend of mine who, you know, uh, was from here in Austin. He's like, dude, you got to come uh, spend a couple days with me here in Austin. We'll go for some bike rides. We did. We rode around for three days here in Austin. He wanted to show me the fact that this was emerging. There was a bike network that was getting started. And all of this was because of a relationship that took place uh, through some really engaged activists and advocates and city council members to reach out to the Dutch cycling embassy to establish a relationship with them in 2012. Uh, so it's been 14 or uh, 12 years since that relationship got established and really started the ball rolling. And so Austin is a great example of an emerging sort of active town where they're building that all ages and abilities, Dutch inspired cycle network out on the ground in an area which you can say is the heart and soul of car culture here in Texas or 326 square miles of sprawl. But 
depending on where you're at, you might be able to have access to everything that you need and never get into a car. And pretty much that's me. You know, we downsized when we made the move from Hawaii to Austin from two cars down to one car and haven't looked back. I mean, being able to ride to pretty much everything that you need to, you know, get to or walk for that matter. I can also walk to a lot of meaningful destinations because the built network is there. The built environment is there and it's welcoming. There's any number of cities. I would say there's more cities than not that are at that aspiring and emerging level. And it's really, really, I think, important to understand just how challenging that is just how challenging it is to get that first project off of the ground, you know, off of the plans and onto the ground, you know, get that, that first tactical urbanism installation, get some pilot programs going, uh, start building out your network in earnest and realizing just how cheap it is to build a high comfort cycle network. It's pennies on the dollar compared to automobile infrastructure. It's just so cheap. It's not even worth talking about is so, you know, cost efficient, good return on investment there, but understanding that every single project induces fear. Every single project is one that's going to be difficult to, to come to fruition because people, you know, fear change the status quo, you know, is really, really hard. And, and I think one of the things that we can do from an empathy perspective is just realize even for ourselves, how pervasive car brain is, motor normativity. Uh, We've just been shaped. We've been flooded by images all around us of that. Oh, of course we drive everywhere for everything all the time. That's what we do. And uh, of course you're going to have a car. In fact, you're probably going to have multiple cars (laughs) in your household. Uh, And so we have to be empathetic to the fact that, you know, so much of the way we see life is through that lens that has been shaped by you mentioned that word, word earlier, framing. It's been framed through very, very, very uh, well-funded initiatives intentionally to get us to think that way first. Sure. The Austin answer is great. I mean, even when you look at building and zoning code changes and the direction of all that, it's a really exciting place from from that standpoint, do things that very much impact and influence the sorts of infrastructure on the transportation front. So I love that example. I, I was down there again in May. I used to live in Dallas, so uh, I folks know how I feel about Dallas, but I always tell everyone, you can skip Dallas and just head, head to Austin. You'll find more of what you're looking for there. Dallas has some great stuff too. I mean, you know. It's true. I mean, I mean you, and that's, I think, one of the most important things is we shouldn't be doing a broad brush stroke and say, oh, all the Dallas, uh, right. poo poo, don't go. No, I mean, Dallas has got some wonderful things going. Yeah. I mean, go on any given day, a beautiful day on the Katy Trail there yeah. in, in Dallas, and you'll just be like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing TOD I've ever seen. Not right. transit oriented development, trail oriented yeah. development. All the businesses that are happening in there and the vitality and the vibrancy that comes by transforming what was an old abandoned rail corridor into a vibrant rail trail where there's wonderful cohesiveness and connectivity to the the community. And that's the, the, the point that I really want to make. I really try to push a positive message oh, yeah. with Active Towns. And we didn't even talk about it. What is Active Towns? Active Towns these days is now a, a multimedia you know platform. Basically, it's my YouTube channel. So it's my podcast. It's the YouTube channel. It's me traveling around the globe, profiling and interviewing the people and the and and understanding you know how these places and the programs that you know are doing a good job how they have come about and so i try to profile those positive success stories in every single city even some of you know i i can't even tell you a city that's solidly a latent city that is just not even thinking about this stuff sure. because i think even some of the the worst of the worst there if somebody is is thinking about it and and trying to get them to becoming a, aspiring and trying to move the needle forward so right yeah. no you know uh, I, ma- I make my dallas jokes but i totally agree with you i i would i spent most of my time on katie trail just going up and down i'm like this is the spot this is where i need to be there <laughs> i uh well, yeah 
and that's a good point though too. And and one of the things that the most recent trip that I that I had there to the Katy Trail uh, was actually when I was driving. I did the road trip uh, up to CNU for for Oklahoma City. Yeah. So I went there and I stopped off in Dallas, met up with some friends, and we did for a nice little walk through that area. But in doing that, we were able to kind of see the the adjoining neighborhoods and the number of people who were able to walk and bike to that destination. Mm. So, and that's an incredibly important thing for cities to to remember. We said it earlier, we talked about it earlier, is don't build these activity assets and thinking of them just as a recreational facility where people will drive to and then park in a parking lot and then use them. It's something that needs to be integrated into the fabric of the community right. so that it can be used both recreational for health promotion and wellness purposes, as well as utilitarian purposes. And, and that brings up the other thing that Katie trail is, is experiencing here at its most busy parts. It's super, super wide and it has a separated, uh, pedestrian realm from the, 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 the cycling realm. And I think that that's an important thing for cities to really realize is that if you're wondering how wide to build it, build it wider. Yes. And as wide as you think it should be, it needs to be wider than that too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I yeah. think that that is a phenomenal sentiment to all cities and all people who are advocating for any sort of infrastructure because it, yeah, I feel like I've never heard someone say we made it wide enough. You know, it's, I mean, it's the same logic that, like you said, freeways is the same thing that goes the negative route, but we also have that same method of, of showing, hey, this is too full. We need to make this bigger. I think that that conversation is also important in the active transportation realm as well to continue to remind folks like, hey, there's expansion talks. We're at that point now, too. We need to talk yeah. about expansion, not just buildings. So. Well, and, and just like what we see on the roads, we, we, we know about car bloat, right? Yeah. About the, the cars, big game, the trucks, SUVs and trucks getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're seeing the same with our active mobility, uh, you know, machine bloat too. Sure. So we're actually seeing, oh, wow. Okay. Cargo bikes. Next thing you know, you've got, you know, family bikes that are wider and longer and you, it's like, oh yeah, even more pressure on having wider, generous things. And even the Dutch and the, and the Danes are going back and looking and saying, yeah, you know, we've got. We, we need to make this even wider because, you know, we, we can at any point in time, we can have, you know, two or three or four cargo bikes trying, you know, trying to pass each other all at the same time. So, right. yeah. Right. And I love, I know your work largely has these phenomenal international examples. I would love to get into a part two of this conversation at some point and go with those. I love starting off with the domestic stuff. So I'm really glad we, we dove deep into that today, but would love to do a, a part two international example. I think you've even done some trips uh, with Jordan Clark, who I think is a shared, shared friend of ours. Um, one of the da folks in Dallas, Dallas Irvinist that is doing some great work there. So I have yeah. followed along with a lot of that work and would, yeah, love to to dive into that at some point. The last question that I ask everyone who comes on this show, and you might have perhaps the most exciting and anticipated answer to this that we've had, just given the nature of how you move um, in your daily life, but also in the places that you've spent time. Out of all the places that you have lived and all the jobs you've worked in, in your life, what has been the best and your favorite commute that you've ever had? Oh, the favorite commute. That is a very, very good uh, question. I'm going to say that my favorite commute is is pointing back to the Boulder area. Um, I, I did have uh, the ability to work from home a good por portion of my career. And, uh, and that's what I do. I mean, this is my spare bedroom. So the studio office here is, is, is a big part of that. But, uh, I was actually part owner in a health club, uh, when I lived in Niwot. And so I was in Boulder County living in Niwot and, uh, running, uh, the, uh, the corporate health company that I was part owner in, but we also owned a health club. And so, uh, I would actually open up the, the facility at like five in the morning or whatever. And I was within walking distance. So that to me was like my best commute. I could literally walk to the health club that I owned and was part owner in and, uh, being able to, uh, interact with, with your, your community members, because, you know, this was a small village and we had this small fitness center, 
a health club and it was a high touch facility and it was wonderful to be able to connect with people. So being able to walk there, you know, a quote unquote five minute walk to your, your place of employment, you can't beat that. It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I mean, there's no, I, I'll say it every day of my life. There's no better commute than just a simple walk that is enjoyable and fulfilling and, and able to be repeated without, you know, much work or effort yeah. um, in terms of planning routes and all of that fun stuff. So can I tell you one, one thing yeah. that I, I, I've ended up doing since I, I launched, you know, Active Towns over a decade ago, since I do mostly work from home, sometimes I have to do a fake commute. Sure. I will like literally like my partner, if she's riding her bike to work, I'm like, can I ride with you? Yeah. So I'll ride my bike in the morning with her to work and then turn around and come back. Or actually, uh, you know, based on where her office used to be, then I'll, I'll pull off and then mm. go for a trail run, get, get some sure. nature time and get some nature Zen experience. And so, because I think that's one of the things that's kind of challenging when you work from home is you got to get out of the house. You've got to get that thing in. And I think that's one of the things from a data point perspective that we did hear from during the pandemic and during the lockdown is the people who most were impacted negatively by not having their commute were the people who were commuting by bike. Hmm. Yeah. They were, they were like, I don't, I, you know, I'm missing that. I, it was, it was joyous. It was fun. I got a little bit of exercise in. it was me time. Um, and so don't underestimate that a commute is a negative thing. It can oftentimes be very, very much a positive thing. And when you lose that active commute, you know, it's like, oh, I yeah. need that. <laughs> right, right. I'm with you to the highest degree. That's why we asked that question at the end. I think so much of the commute in, in the American context has become such a, a laborsome chore and yeah. I found, and maybe, you know, part through luck, part through the work that I, I've done to make it this way is it's arguably my favorite part of my day is my movement to and from my destinations. And uh, I think that that is a way to, again, going back to our earlier conversation about seeing the benefit of these things in a short term for a lot of folks, this is a great way to see that benefit is to get this, you know, repeated part of your day that you kind of non-negotiably have to do and really make it something that you look forward to, not something that you dread. It's a really subtle difference that I think has an endless and um, un untapped potential in terms of what it can do for you and for your community. So yeah. can I mention one more thing yeah, yeah, sure. about, uh, about commute too, is because also of the pandemic, uh, we sort of, you know, the thought people who are thinking about this stuff, you know, out here, we started to really think about our language too and and looking at this because we're like, there is an overemphasis um, from a mobility perspective on the commute. Mm -hmm. When you look at the data that is actually collected in the United States, it skews towards the commute, which, you know, because of historical context, it skews towards a lot of other things that sort of, you know, create, you know, inequities. I think it's really important for us to like kind of like maybe even re reframing it from the commute, the work commute to how do we get around to mm -hmm. our meaningful destinations? Because then it's like, oh, well, okay, that's, that's not my commute. That's like all the other things that take place because again, with even more people not having a commute, uh, it, it, it is more encompassing of things. And so we're able to, to really embrace that. The other thing I wanted to mention, because I love double entendres, is the name of your podcast, Good Traffic, because you know, a lot of times people understand traffic to be a negative thing, just like the commute be a negative thing. But the reality is, is that it, you know, traffic can be a very much good. It can be a good thing, uh, especially if you happen to be a, you know, downtown, you know, retail store or, you know, operation where you want lots of foot traffic. You want people, you know, coming in and you want, you know, that person on the bike that's like, oh, they're having a really cool sale. I'm going to pop on in and, and go to that. So that's, you know, it's always been interesting to me that traffic became the, the, the terminology became negative when in fact, right. Previously in other industries, it's an, it's a overwhelmingly positive, 
uh, thing. And I love double entendres too. Just like with active towns, uh, yes, you know, part of the perspective that I have is that, yeah, you can be physically active and get out. But the other thing that I reinforce with folks is that active towns, those people, because they're out and about within their communities, they're also socially active too. Mm -hmm. They're engaged members of society. So there's that double entendre again. Look at us. Yeah, we just got a perfect joint ad there for both of our both of our names. I love that so much. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, it's, we need to find more of these sorts of words in these situations where people can relate to them for various ways. Because, again, like you've mentioned multiple times, it's, it doesn't close off people from the conversation before right. it even starts. And I think a lot of the times in this urbanism conversation, we do shut people off from the larger, you know, just entering the talk in the first place, let alone being a part of it or changing your life or being a part of your community's change. So I'm all about that for sure. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. We'll link all the great work you do in the description and everywhere. I, I think a lot of folks are familiar with what you do that are in my sphere, but if they're not, they, uh, they will certainly be excited to check out all the awesome storytelling that you do. And as we talked about a few times, thank you for just the optimistic conversation too. Again, in our space, we do have a lot of, it's easy to get negative when you're, you know, biking next to larger and larger trucks every day, or you're walking and almost getting hit. And we need to continue to have an optimistic feel to the solutions that are underway, like you're mentioning in a lot of these emerging and, and, uh, potential markets. So, um, I'm always grateful to hear that and see that. And, uh, you do it in a, in a phenomenal way that I think is really accessible to, to a lot of folks, whether or not they have previous contacts in the space. So appreciate all that you do. And thanks again for coming on today. Yes. My pleasure. Thank you, Brad.